What's up, everybody? I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief at Front Office Sports. Welcome back to another episode of the My Other Passion podcast. Really appreciate everybody who's tuning in, leaving those five-star reviews on Apple, on Spotify. You know, we really did solid numbers on the Apple podcast charts with the first episode with Frankie Muniz. So seriously, everybody who checked that out, appreciate it. We're back with another banger today. I spoke to Boston Celtic Grant Williams. You probably saw him. You know, he really stepped out on a big stage for the first time. The Celtics made it to the NBA Finals this year. They made it past Kevin Durant, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and the Milwaukee Bucks. And low-key, a big part of that was Grant Williams. Uh, He has a long way to go in the league. I think he knows that. Boston Celtics fans know that. Anybody who watched, you know, the games know that. But at the same time, I think he put a lot of people on notice this season. And he certainly has really high hopes and expectations for himself. And he's ready to put in the work. Uh, With that comes a really interesting, diverse background when it comes to passions and interests. I mean, this guy's mom worked for NASA. His dad was a bodyguard for a lot of famous musicians and entertainers. Uh, He actually turned down offers from Harvard and Yale for college, wound up going to Tennessee. Uh, He's a big gamer. Not only is he like board game, plays Sellers of Catan religiously, but, you know, me and him are going back and forth about Xbox versus PlayStation and how gaming actually informs the work that he does as a professional basketball player. Uh, He's also really into Marvel, really into the whole MCU And he actually has names from the MCU for every player on the team. Like, you know, I'll I'll let him describe that when we get into the episode, but it's super interesting. And that's what we want to do on this podcast. Like, it's not just about, hey, you play a sport or you work for this company and here's the unrelated thing that you do. It's really about, you know, how do all these things inform each other? If, if Grant Williams is obsessed with gaming and he's on, you know, Call of Duty and Rocket League all the time, what does that actually mean to his career as an NBA player, as a kid coming in, trying to prove himself? And what I found out from our conversation is that it means a lot. So really excited to have Grant here. Buckle in. It's going to be a great episode, whether you're an NBA fan, whether you're a Celtics fan, or you just want to find out, you know, what it's like to have a dream grow up, achieve it, and then figure out how to take things to the next level. So let's go ahead and get into it. Let's get Grant on here. And uh, looking forward to this episode. I hope you enjoy it. This is it, the putt to win the tournament. If you sink it, the championship is yours. But you don't, because on the backswing, your hat falls over your eyes, you can't see anything. Sound familiar? Is this how you're running your business? Poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated finance software? To see the full picture, you got to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system. It'll give you a full picture of your business. And that type of visibility and control gives you everything you need for your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and much, much more. NetSuite is everything you need in one easy place. It'll help you automate your manual processes, close your books in time, and really just keep you ahead of the competition. 93% of surveyed businesses say they increase their visibility and control after upgrading to NetSuite. In fact, over 31,000 businesses already use NetSuite, and this summer, NetSuite has a special financing program for those who are ready to upgrade at netsuite.com slash myotherpassion. So go ahead and head over there, netsuite.com slash myotherpassion, for the special one-of-a-kind financing offer on the number one financial system for growing businesses. One last time, netsuite.com slash myotherpassion. Now let's get back to the show. All right, Grant Williams, welcome to the My Other Passion podcast. Extremely excited to have you here today. What's going on? Thanks for having me, man. I'm in L.A. just enjoying the beautiful views, man. Having a great time working out and getting back to the basketball. Nice. So working out, what else is going on in L.A.? I know you're normally based out of Boston with the Celtics. Uh, What brings you to the West Coast? I'm in L.A. too, by the way. Oh, nice. Yeah, the the reason why um, I'm on the West Coast partially is because of the ESPYs. I left Vegas from Summer League. And I usually do a week out in L.A. just throughout the year. 
just to train, play pickup, um, get back to basketball, really, and, and just enjoy the time. I enjoy the West Coast. I don't, I've never really been in a city like L.A., so it's good to get here or go to San Diego or places around it and just spend some time. Nice. Yeah, do you get into the Hollywood scene as well on top of working out? You know, you hit the spots, you meet up with any – celebs or anything like that i think that's what a lot of people associate la with like all the guys come out and you know you work out but you get to enjoy some of the fruits of that that nba life but what's the case for you as of right now i haven't uh maybe in the future i I probably would take advantage but i'm so focused on ball that all that extra stuff i haven't been able to do as much so the espies is the most i've been able to do i'll say most times i'll go for hikes and just explore explore the city than anything else Nice. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Um, you're, you're relatively new to the league. I know you're, you're very focused on, you know, stepping your game up. I see pretty much all your stats, you know, minutes are up points per game. I think you're up to 7.8 now. Um, but where do you think you're headed? You know, I think I've seen people say, you know, Grant is going to be one of the best in the league. I've seen people who, who, you know, who doubt, who have problems with certain moments from the playoffs. But, like, where are you at mentally and personally just in terms of, you know, after a season like this last one, making it to the NBA Finals, getting so close to that mountaintop, uh, you know, what can people look out for for you from you next season? My mentality is going to the moon, honestly. It's, um, like you said, my mentality takes me to want to be one of the best that's doing it, and it takes me to be one of the most competitive people doing it. Um this finals round was great in a sense of experience, but it didn't go the way we wanted it to. So now it's about converting that and changing that and becoming special in what we do. That sounds right. How did you, how was it, you know, facing up against uh, Giannis, against KD, uh, you know, against these completely revered players and, and being able to go, you know, toe to toe with them and, and make it past them? you know, over the past couple of months in the during the playoffs? Honestly, it was it was dope just because um, this is something that you always, as a kid, you know, you dreamed of being one of the guys that's playing against players like that. And for me, it was cool because I knew I, w- I was going to be com- able to compete, but I really held my own. And there's not many guys that can say that in this league and try to take full advantage of saying, like, if that's the case and you did that, now you have to take it to another level. Now you have to be able to not defend multiple different positions at the point all the way down to the five like you normally do, but at a higher level. But you also have to compete on the other side of the basketball. And I feel like that's my next improvements is just being able to offer a little more offensive uh, capabilities on a consistent basis because I provide the shooting. I provide the um, closeout reads, but I don't have them necessarily provided the creation for others, myself, and everything like that. So um, that's really the goal moving forward. But it makes me feel... Um, reassured that not only was I able to compete with those guys, but I held my own and um, really did a, a really, really good, good job on them. Yeah, I think you put a lot of people on notice during this last playoff run, but is that something where do you get into, you know, trash talk? Do you get into, you know, going toe for toe, just, hey, I might be new to the league, I might not have the rep that you do, but, like, I'm going to bring it to you? Or are you just kind of like a quiet, humble dude? Um, You know, I'm wondering how that works. Because I saw you post, you know, on your IG. You got you and Giannis, you and KD. Um, Clearly you were proud of that. But, you know, does it get intense or you just do the job you got to do? So for me, it just depends on the person. Like, normally I do the job I'm supposed to do. I'm normally – I'm a talkative guy, but I'm not necessarily a guy that talks trash a ton. But um, there's certain certain uh, players and certain things that bring that out, you know. Um, like, I remember in the Bucks series, it wasn't even Giannis. I was talking to, I was talking mostly Bobby. In the Nets series, I was talking to mostly Bruce. And then, like, in each series, as time went on, I just had different guys that would talk talk and go back and forth with. But at the same time, I was able to just um, be smooth and let it let it ride out. Because for me, I'm, po- I'm doing my job. That's what, all I'm supposed to do. And, and if not, and I, everything I do outside of that, in terms of like the chatting, in terms of that stuff, that's just fun, you know. Everything, nothing's ever personal. That's stuff that you enjoy, and that's the stuff that kind of makes the game even better, where you have that grittiness, and that's what I had throughout that. I feel like the playoffs, where I would 
I would definitely have my, my assignment and I take that fully seriously. And if that person started talking, I would draw back. But after that, I would just kind of play the, play the game a little bit. But what about you and Draymond? Like, I think everybody recognized that you and him were really going at it and he's, you know, prolific for his, his trash talking. Um, and he seems like the type of guy I know it's a lot of fun and it's like competitive in the moment. But I think with Draymond, people wonder, is it getting personal? Like, do you really go to bed mad at this dude and like ready to wake up and check him? Like, you know, you all were getting into it. I, is there anything that we don't know about, you know, how it went down with Draymond where you're like, yeah, you might have got the ring this year, but like, bro, I'm on you this season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how I approach it anyway. Like those those guys, those warriors, like as much as they got the chance the championship and everything like that, they gotta you know, they have to do it again. They have to repeat it if they're going you know, we're not gonna let it be easy nor are we gonna let anybody else understand. We have we had control of the East last season, we're trying to do it again. So uh for me, like especially the trash over with Dre, like I grew up kinda like idolizing them in a sense. So like now it's like being able to go back and forth with them, like we said personal things for sure but nothing was personal off the floor like everything that we did we left it on and that's why afterwards we were able to talk communicate dap up everything else see him in the public good but like on the court we don't i'm gonna say no friendships no nothing like uh we were we were talking a little reckless so what happened when y'all ran into each other at the michael rubin party because i saw half the comments on your ig was like bro it's supposed to be on site when you see draymond like why are y'all hugged up in the same picture yeah, it was we were just chatting, like, and then we just took a picture with Tamika, who's our executive director for the PA. Like, it's, at the end of the day, in the league, I always say, like, it's all love, but on the court, there is no love, you know what I mean? Um, like, even the, the people always talk about the old days and stuff like that. Michael played golf with guys, you know? Like, it's like you have those personal relationships still, but at the end of the day, just because you're friends with somebody on, off the floor or you have a relationship with them off the floor doesn't mean that you can't complete, compete with them or go to the highest level with them on the floor, you know, or treat it as if you don't even know the person and you're going directly at somebody's heart and taking taking that and moving forward. Like, so that's exactly what it was where all the comments may say, like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? But at the end of the day, there's there's life outside of basketball. And then basketball, when it gets onto the heat in the moment, it's over. Yeah. What was Michael Rubin's party like just because – so many people there, you know, Dirk, Drake, Meek, Fat Joe, Lil Baby, all the rappers are there, a bunch of your colleagues in the NBA. Um, what was that room like? Any any special interactions or conversations, uh, especially with the rap guys, because you're on the court all the time with the basketball players. But, like, what happens when you run into Lil Dirk or Lil Baby or Drake? Yeah, it was a, it was a great time, like, just in terms of connecting, in terms of learning, hearing people's stories and having talking. Um, I I just think that it was a great way of like getting to know somebody. He did a great job of connecting people, not only just from the rap scene, but also from the business world, from the like basketball world. And so just hearing those stories about like things they went through in life, things with, like told my stories about how things I've gone through. Not only been in the league, but before it, just um seeing how how it's funny how our lives are com- very comparable, you know. And then, like, the night, you know, it was beautiful, like, scenic. It was a great house set up, um, great dinner. Um, just a just a great, you know, time just to be able to, like, understand and, and get to know people, but also have a great time while doing it. All right. Does does any one of the, you know, the musician interactions stand out? Because I want to talk about Marvel, Settlers of Catan, all the gaming stuff. I actually saw Rocket League on the screen. Uh, but I love to talk to people about music and you know, do you catch up with Dirk or Drake or any of those people and say, you know, if you have one anecdote with one rapper from there, it'd be cool to hear. Um, you know, I don't know how it goes if you catch up and say, oh, man, this verse changed my life or <laughs> anything like yeah, that. Yeah, so, so I didn't have any of those moments where I was um, talking about the verses that changed and like that, but we definitely had moments where we just talked about life and, like, what can be done. Like, I was talking to ASAP, Ferg, just talking about places to go, trips to take, um, like the Amalfi, like being able to go to the ER, stuff like that. I was talking to Meek and just talking about the life, like outside of like the, like coming from prison and back going to um, the normal day to day living and stuff like that. Like it was, it was a dope vibe just because everybody was just so comfortable, like because they felt like everyone was there for a good reason. Everyone, no one was there for 
like I'm recording this behind your back or we're just being honest with each other. We're um, being straightforward and stuff that like you just can can really communicate with others and, and share your experiences so it doesn't happen to them. Nice. Well, talking about experiences and life and where you come from, I know you grew up in Charlotte, right? You went to school in Tennessee. Um, how did those experiences help form the person that you are today? And uh, what's this that I've read about you turning down Harvard and Yale? And um, did you just find that Tennessee was able to offer you more with basketball? Uh, you know, what's the story there? Yeah, so for me, I um, went to Tennessee because I grew up in Charlotte, as you know. Um, it was great, comfortable living because I love Charlotte. It's a beautiful city. It's a place where I say you can live at any point in your life. And during that high school time, looking back at it, actually, it's a couple of years, it's years now, um, I was getting recruited by Yale most of my career, most of my high school career. Um, I didn't have many high major offers. I was a tweener. I was overweight. I was a guy that even when, when Davidson recruited me, Bob McKillop told me the reason why I'm not offering you is because you don't work hard enough. So from then on, my sophomore year, I started working harder and harder because I knew the academics were going to be there. But athletic, athletically, I had never had the necessary give back. So next thing you know, um, Tennessee got, hired my one of the coaches that I got fired from a different school, UNC Charlotte. His name was Desmond Oliver. And he, he got hired Tennessee under Coach Barnes. And it was my senior year. By then, all I had was my my mid-majors and then um, the Ivy Leagues, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, those guys. And he asked me, he said, listen, I know you don't know any of the staff, but I want you to trust me. I want you to know that, like, like this is, like, the school I'm going to be at, this is going to be me and you. We're going to take this and we're going to move forward. So I allowed them, you know, to recruit me. It was my senior year. And for some reason, I had a gut feeling that I should just, you know, trust it and trust him. Um, I had a phenomenal relationship with Coach Jones at Yale. Coach Emmerich at Harvard was dope. Um, the guys at Princeton, you know, did a good job recruiting me as well. And at the end of the day, like, my mom being worse at NASA, so she was pushing Ivy, Ivy, Ivy. But for me, I was like, you know what? Academically, I'm going to challenge myself either way. I'm going to get my degree in three years. If I go to Tennessee, I'm going to get my master's in my fourth if I go. And then at, at Yale or Harvard, I'll have the Harvard-Yale degree. So these are things that are going through my head. And next thing you know, I told my mom, I said, look, I, I made my decision. I'm going to Tennessee. I want to bet on myself, not only in the basketball sense, but I also want to be close enough home where my grandparents come see me play. I, I, all these different things where it's like I trust Coach Barnes and I trust the staff and the direction that they're headed. And then I, I promised her I'll graduate in three years, which I did. And then go get my, if I went back for my fourth, get my master's. And like it all, it all worked out at the end of the day. I'm thankful. But – those are the, the the reason why I went there. Yeah, the mom working at NASA is amazing. How did that, like, growing up, what type of impact did that have on how you viewed the world? Right. So I feel like because of the different positions my mom and my dad held, you know, I kind of have a different perception. My mom being an academic, um, she's worked at NASA, being a person that, like, understands how much value comes with, like, being educated and being able to have conversations and to fit in different rooms. And then my dad being in the stage management, like producing and also security side of the world, where, and also just travel, I mean, with the American Airlines sometimes too, but like, I remember going to concerts growing up. I remember talking to um, different rappers and artists, like even Charlie, like Charlie Wilson too, and then like all the way to Lil Wayne, all like different, different, different vibes. And I remember seeing that life always gave me a good perspective because I was like, okay, these people are normal as well. So it was like, all right, treat treat everything as that. So whenever I have an interaction, I treat everybody the same. And so I have the social, I feel like I have the social skills and I also have the um, academia, academic background too, which allows me to have a little, little one-up on people, I feel like, at times. But yeah, I love to hear that about how, you know, your mom gave you one perspective, your father gave you another. Right. Um, how How does that inform what you're doing now in the NBA. Like that's really a big part of what this podcast is about. I want to actually hear the same thing about your hobbies and uh, you know, some of the other stuff you're interested in, like I was saying, but this academic ambition is a big part of it. But so many people just kind of consider that like a different world than the NBA. And maybe it is in some ways, but do you find that, Hey, there's ways that having a mom who really instilled the importance of education in me pays off on the court absolutely yeah i feel like most of my relationships because of, because are because of that 
like you're able to have conversations with different groups, not only within the NBA, but also ownership, um, making connections um, outside of in the business world and understanding the, the, the conversations that you're having. Because sometimes when you have those relationships, you have no idea. So like for me, because of the academic background, I love to learn. So even if I don't understand something, I'll try and get to understand it. And my mom, I always told my mom, I said, if I learn, if I can learn how to do this algebra or geometry question, like, and do it well, like, learning a play on the basketball floor should be easy, you know? Like, in comparison, like, you should be able to have a better understanding. And that perspective allows me to not only be in the role that I'm in now with the PA and offer great insight to, like, what can be done both to work to help the business as a whole, but also help players off the floor and where we can get better connection-wise and understanding each other. Yeah, tell me more about NBA PA. Congrats on the uh, the VP role. What does that entail? And even more so, what do you really want to get done? Like, I heard what you just said now, but I don't know if you can get more specific in terms of, hey, I'm on, I believe, through 2024 in this position. Um, this is what I want to accomplish. This is what I think is really important outside of the Celtics getting that ring next year. It's what I want to right. get done for the community. Yeah, for me, it's always been how can we make all 450 players that are within the league and as the years go on understand not only their finances, but also understand like their life and what they can accomplish. You know, there's no better time to do things when, than when you're in the NBA. When you're outside of it, pe- people start stop losing that interest. So take advantage of the platform you have now, whether that's within your community, whether that's through connections in the business world, whether that's just to trying to accomplish and try different things. That's how I always feel. And for me, I've always been a big time like community person. Like we are, we're so unique. There's only 450 of us. Like people are trying to get here every single day. Like be be blessed to be here, but also like get to know the people around you. Like encouraging players to be more involved with one another, to be more trusting because we're all, basically all we got, all the guys that understand this life. And from a PA perspective, protecting the players not only from the benefits perspective, but also in salaries and making sure that no one can ever go broke again. Yeah, that whole mentality has changed. I love hearing about the young guys, even, you know, yourself. You're not – you haven't been in the league very long. Um, we've learned those lessons. You know, people have seen people make tremendous amounts of money and have nothing. Uh, and now I hear younger guys saying, yeah, I only spend my endorsement money. You know, yeah, this is the ways that I prioritize saving. But but how hard is that? How hard is it to be 23, all of a sudden you're a multimillionaire, Um you know, I know everybody wants to get some toys, you know, things that you've looked at and kind of aspired toward your whole life. Uh, what's your what's your mentality? Are you like are you like a, a Kawhi who's driving like a 05 something or or are you like, yeah, no, I, I ball out. I got the car that I wanted. But, you know, here's here's how I'm responsible. Like, I wonder what the reality you always either hear about someone who's just doesn't spend a dime or someone who's just really extravagant and what's like the more common reality and what's your experience when it comes to just being, you know, a young man who's coming to a solid amount of money. Yeah. I like to spend my money. Um, mostly I, I like to invest, but also and I, I take care of my family. I take care of people that I care for, especially like I, I do a lot of like tuition giving. I do a lot of stuff like that. But for me, like, I've never been, like, a car guy. I've never been a person that makes extravagant driving pers- person purchases. Like, even my car, I had my first year was my Toyota RAV4 from college. And then this past two years, the only reason I, I gave my car to my grandparents, because I, I paid off their car and then gave them mine and traded it back in. They traded theirs back in. So for me, I got at least lease a car. I know that I don't sort of depreciate any asset. Yes, technically a rental, but, like, I potentially... Like, I rarely drive. I have a three-year, 36,000-mile lease, and I have 10,000 miles on the car after three years. So it's not like I'm on the move or on the road a ton. So just um, those are the things that I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to be frugal as I can, but also, you know, be comfortable. I spend money on travel more than anything else. I enjoy experiences. I enjoy being able to, like, have a good time and have a, uh, good m- memories as well as good, you know, pictures and stuff like that where you have good views and stuff like that. That's that's my, my best in, uh, type of time for me. Yeah, what's the coolest place that you might have hit uh, during one of these off seasons that you're like, yeah, I've been waiting to get to this city or country, and I was able to go and, and do it up proper? <laughs> I wish I could tell you because of 
COVID, I had, I have to say, let's just say that it's been kind of slow for me. Right. I've been to Aruba, which is dope, which is um, a group of friends. But like this, is my, I'm doing my first Europe trip this summer. Okay. Um, that'll be a great time, and I'm, I'm super excited for going to London and a couple of other places. Awesome. You say you're into businesses and investing. Um, what type of investments have you made thus far? You know, um, obviously you're probably pretty early in your investment career, but what's the portfolio looking like? Yeah, it's pretty spread out. I have a couple of real estate dealings. I have a couple of uh, venture investments. Um, my brother does a little bit of my crypto and everything like that sector. I have stocks and bonds. I feel like I spread my portfolio as much as I can just because I'm a generalist. I try and understand everything, but I'm not a specialist where I can understand one certain thing yet. You know, until I find that niche, I think I'm going to do my best to just gain knowledge and try and learn much about every single different type of investment, every single type of careers. So, um I have a pretty diverse portfolio, um, and they're very, very kind of safe, I would say, just because I'm not to the point yet where I can make dangerous investments, but um, as time goes on, you'll be able to take a little bit more risk into effect, and I'm excited to be able to like just have good good base knowledge before that happens. Is there a company or two that you're especially excited about uh, that you're you know getting in on? Yeah, um, I'm excited because I, I'm partnering with Koya. Um, that's going to be a good, good one. Uh, it's vegan, even though I'm not vegan. Um, it's one of those things where I just have faith in the brand. And, and also, people forget, like, I'm not vegan either, but I eat vegan stuff all the time. Like, it's good, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. I always say, like, you don't have to be vegan to enjoy vegan products or to be able to uh, take advantage of It's a great health side of, side of things and understanding it. So, um for me, that's one investment that I would say I'm very encouraged and proud of. I'm excited to see what, what as the future goes. I got to put you on. There's a spot out here. Uh, it's in the Valley. And I don't know if you like Chinese food, like kind of. Love it. Okay. So you like a good General So's orange chicken with the rice. Dog, they got a vegan spot. I can't even tell the difference. It's like. Really? It's like they do soy chicken. And it is so good. <laughs> I had a week. I almost. Don't like it as much anymore because for about two weeks, I played it oh, out. I was just getting it every other day. Um, super good though. It's really, it's really pretty amazing where vegan food has gone. Yeah, it's, I'm about to say it's grown so much. People and people's understanding of it has, has to grow too because not every time is it just like what are they eating like like <laughs> salads? Like you don't know. No, it's not how it works. Right. So how? Uh, how does the video game stuff work? Like, it seems like... Ooh, uh, that's another event I'm, I'm excited about. I was wondering that. What, uh, you got, like, a developer or something? You you put some, you know, got a stake in? No, so I'm I'm partner with uh, Boston Breach as well as Oxygen Sports. It's an e- e- esports company as well as the TPL, which um, I'm excited for. That'll hopefully be launching here in the future. Um, I'm excited to create it with the players and... It's a uh, it's both both are very exciting. I'm a big gamer. I enjoy um like to the social environment of it as well as the competitive aspect of it. You know, as it, for anyone like board games, card games, video games, I can play anything. And the video game side of things, um, it's a great way to pass time. It's a great way to connect with your friends from home, but also in, in different communities. It brings a different liking to to your life because sometimes gaming doesn't always involve like sport watching. Versus some people game just the game. Other people game and they also watch sports. Like it just, it brings different communities together. And um, those that's an investment I would say I'm very, very proud of just because, and after success, I believe they're third right now or, or fourth right now in the uh, CDL uh, when they, literally this first year. So everyone would have expected them to be last, but they're competing at a high level through the methods and caps and all those guys. Can we get a little, because like, Low key, I'm a I'm a big gamer too. I'm so I'm exactly ten years older than you. I'm December first, nineteen eighty eight. Oh wow! And in fact, I was born a few minutes after midnight, so I almost shared November thirtieth with you. You almost shared our birthday. Yep. So, um, I came of age. Genesis, Sega Genesis was my first system. I got PlayStation. Got PlayStation two after that. Then I switched to Xbox with 360. I haven't looked back. I got how it has to go. I got the one. Go. I got the Series X. Uh, Ooh, I, no, no, no. I love the one. The one Series X. You got to switch back. What do you mean? I always say like the best way to do it is PS, PS2, Xbox 360, PS4, PS5. 
Oh, you tripping? Who, I mean, I, who wants that PS5? It's like the size of a god. Like, who wants that? I mean, look, I get it. You want the cube of the Xbox? Xbox. It's Series beautiful. X? It's well designed. Plus, we got Game Pass. We have a beautiful ecosystem. I got right here on my phone. I got the mobile. The no, streaming. There's, PlayStation, there's PlayStation. There's PlayStation Plus. There's the God of. You don't have access to God of. Like, we don't have access to Halo. Yes, I still have an Xbox, but if I want to play Halo. <laughs> Like everything else is do cross cross platform, and then you have access to God of War. You have access to so many different games, Spider Man. You have access to so many different games, Batman. Oh, but so there's so many Sony exclusives that maybe when those don't go away, you can switch back to Xbox. But as of right now, Game Pass, same similar thing with PlayStation Plus, and you can get the same similar type of games. So like I've never been. A, I've, I always say like the community side of things. I prefer PlayStation how the system runs and everything else in terms of like configurations and stuff like that, right. but. From like the Xbox, I remember I have great memories from my 360, and I have great memories from my one. But I had both systems. I had the PS4, and that's what something I stick stuck with. Of course, and that's another thing. Like we're all grown now, so console wars are a little bit corny and dated. But at the same time, I still <laughs> I still love them, even if we're grown and we can all afford to get both systems, or many of us can. Um, it's right. still like that's why people get into Coke versus Pepsi, Celtics versus Lakers. Like people just like Absolutely. rivalries, you know. Um, so I will let you have PlayStation. I will contend. You know, y'all have some great exclusives. I'm like a Halo, Forza, Gears type of dude, which okay, you know, might be dated. But I just I fell in love with them at 360, and I just haven't looked back. My boy Phil Spencer is is tearing it up this generation i feel like you know the activision acquisition but you know it's crazy to me i'm like why don't y'all just be bold enough to make call of duty exclusive if you if you get activision but they're like no we're gonna keep it multi plat i'm like why are you spending 70 billion then because i feel like they they have to because if they don't the out outrage of the communities like that's that'd be crazy like especially how, how um call of duty is like how big of the community you lose, you lose so much of your market because you don't have PC or or PS5 content. So then you kind of you lose out on making it's the a lot of money to leave on the table. Like which I don't know if people buying Xbox consoles. I was say, do you think people are more willing to buy a fifty dollar game or like it's a thousand or eight hundred dollar system? I know? was just so that's exactly I like I don't think that making it exclusive is going to convert everyone to go grab a Series X. You know, just so they could play Call of Duty. You probably do a lot, but you know, you got you got to think about their margins on everything. It's a lot of stuff that right. goes into it, but that's definitely a power move if they can get it pulled off and regulated. I know some of the regulators, even the FCC here, is like, you know, raising some issues with it. But I think they'll probably get the deal done. Right. So, um, <laughs> we got into our our system wars convo, but some of the specific games, like I've seen you play Rocket League. Um, I guess what else? I know Settlers of Catan, like you played a board, say. you played a board game version. Um, can you tell us about your love of those things um, and why gaming is a passion for you? But again, with all of these, I think people just view gaming as a hobby, and it seems like you have a deeper connection with it. And is it something about it that informs who you are as a player? Um, you know, informs how you approach life and and how you approach, you know, competition. I always say gaming keeps your mind active. It keeps you able to, like, be be able to, like, react, you know? Because when you play in basketball, you're able to, when you see a different defensive coverage, when you see a guy shift his feet, having that reaction time, it's huge. And that's how I feel like it is with, like, especially video gaming. And then from, a like, another gaming perspective, I always say it's a great social um, connection where you can enjoy people's company, where you can um, connect with people that you don't necessarily like. Same with sport, you can connect with people that don't really know what you're about, what you're doing, but through a game, you can spend time with them and, and get to know their lives, you know, or get to know exactly how they are just through the game itself. I love golfing now. Uh, I play Rocket League, I play Call of Duty, I play um, FIFA, a lot of different games. I'm loving the Fall, game, Fall Guys right now. Fall Guys, hey, listen, Fall Guys was my game for a while. It fell off, and now it's coming back, I guess you could say. And then the same with um, Among Us and stuff like that, because like, those are all games where you can kind of just have that connection with your friends. Among Us was a huge thing for me during COVID because like, you didn't get to spend time with anyone, but you can have like a great you know, 
debating arguments at times, and then you have your comfortable nights where you both all come together. And do you do the Celtics like get into it on the road? Do do guys bring their their systems and y'all hop on the two K and stuff like that, or is once the season's underway, it's like a little more serious and people aren't concerned about that, or is it still kind of like, nah, that's part of our social dynamic? Yeah, it's definitely part of our social dynamic. We play Uno on the plane all every single trip. Uh, we play cards every now and again, like Pitch and Boomerang and different, different card games. We um, play Spades. I was about to say, we bring our systems too. Uh, guys sometimes bring, like I bring a travel PC like or, or a lap, gaming laptop, so that way it's not as bulky as a PS5 or trying to hook it up to Core's TV, everything like that. So it um, depends on the person. You need, but a sing, all, you need a separate suitcase for that humongous PS5. You need a separate one for that humongous Xbox, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> who's like the, who's the best at Uno or Spades? Like, is Jason Tatum or, or Jalen Brown is one of them, like, a beast, and people don't realize, like, dog, they are crazy at Yeah, JT's JT's... Let's just say JT's not the he's he's good at Bure. He doesn't play any other games. Al is the best at Uno in my opinion. Uh he's just he's the OG of the game. Uh Call of Duty is I would say it's myself. Um and then like each I feel like everybody has their like their specialty. Like uh Tice is pretty was pretty good. Smart was pretty good. Um D White, like we all we all were very, very motivated in, in playing. It was very competitive. But in terms of the respective games, I feel like I take I take the cake, I'll taste the cake, and then uh, it's a toss up for all the other ones. Cool. Do you uh, get to hang out with those guys much outside of you know in a teammate capacity? Like I think people always wonder: is it just you know it's business? We're on a team together; we have a common goal. Or do you ever say, "Oh, I'm gonna go to JT's house and kick it," or we went out, or we hit in a concert? I mean, like, what's the the rapport like uh, outside of the locker room with this team it was very close uh we hung out all, outside of it. we had team dinners we had individual dinners everything like that and your spats i had it as well but um i feel like it depends on the team and also depends on the people some people are social some people are willing to you know be involved and do things others are very reserved or have families at home like there's always a dynamic of like all right now that we're done here it's not like we can go back to the dorm and play video games like in college like it's like people have to go home to their families to their kids it's like for us, it's just a matter of like understanding your time, but also like you see somebody every day. There might be times where you want to get away and just be on your own. So like we have a mix of that too, where you like have that time where you go get dinners with guys and there's going to be times where you don't want to see anybody. All right. The way that gaming informs some of the dynamic between the team, uh, I think music comes up a lot, like between the fact that just rappers and musicians and NBA players tend to have relationships. You see James Harden and Lil Baby running around, best friends, uh, which I think both of them were at Michael Rubin's party. So they were, might, yeah. Are they really like BFF? Like, did you, I, don't, I, I don't know if they're BFF. It, it's, like, it's, like, it's a meme, though, at this point, because they'd be at Fashion Week together and stuff. So, you know, it's interesting. Um, but is there a song that you all rallied around? Um, you know, is there someone like like you or Al or, you know, Tatum, Jalen, who come in and it's like, I got the speakers and I'm running the playlist and this is the music I like. Or, you know, I always love like Jimmy Butler would be singing Taylor Swift and stuff, annoying his teammates. Like, what are some of the music uh, memories and and kind of like uh, routines that your team has? I remember um, everybody was different, but I know that the only person that used to get like the speaker on on like with intent was JT because he always played Jay Z, yeah. like Jay Z was his thing. But we we had a diverse portfolio of guys like different music. So, like uh, I remember like you said, Jimmy Butler. It's funny because he listens to country music too. But like um, for us, it was like we played, and you would next you know you come in, you have J Cole. Next thing you know, your next day you might have Future. The next day you have Boogie. Next day you have it was a different different rap R and R B guys and then we had the old school we had an old school night where we had like like we went back to the eighties, nineties, like R and B so like it was like you have good vibes. You have blast when Dennis was there. Like it was it was pretty cool, like diverse a diverse catalog. Nice. Well another one of uh you know your big passions, the way that academia, gaming sounds like music, all of that is is uh is Marvel. You know, yes. from, what, from what I understand, you're seriously into the movies, the characters, the comic books. Um, 
and I heard something about how you have nicknames for uh, your teammates based off of the different characters, but um, I would love to hear that. But can you tell us just your own experience? Like, you know, who do you love the most from the MCU? You know, what do you think of DC? Um, Like, what is your perspective on this past? What is it? 08 was Iron Man. So it's been, has it been like, is that 14 years? years? Yeah. Yeah, So uh, it's really completely changed the culture to the point where like, you know, a director can't even go out and promote a movie, you know, Martin Scorsese without people being like, well, what do you think of the industry now because of Marvel? And, you know, what's your take on it as someone who grew up right as all of this stuff is really taking off? Yeah, I love it. Um, so I was always like growing up, I was always a Iron Man and Thor fan, you know, and then Spider Man as well. Um, those are like my three main guys. And then as the years went on, I started just following MC the MCU as well as following Marvel Comics as much as I can. I uh, don't collect nor do like have a chance to read a ton, but I try my best to like stay informed. Um, and then in terms of DC, I love it too, just because, uh, like the Batman name that I got this past year, was pretty dope just because like of anyone I'd rather, I want to be Batman, you know, in the DC verse and then the Marvel verse, like I always say like a Spider-Man and one of those guys would be cool just to be on like a social environment, a social kid, the one that can be reserved, but also, you know, quirky, goofy. And like, I always say like Marvel has like you said, like with gaming and, and sports, it brings everyone together. So Marvel has done that, not only from young ages, but all the way down, all the way to adults, all the way to elderly. Like everyone can go to a Marvel movie and feel comfortable and have a great time and a great experience. It's very nostalgic as the years went on. Like I remember Infinity War, in game, like after developing the plot for the past like twenty plus movies, like that is something I've heard of. Like name another franchise has done that, and that's why I was like, this is a special, special. Thing that they have here and it's going to continue to be great phase four has been good so far i'm excited for phase five when everything's like this is still like the slower development stage so now when the next stage it picks up i'm gonna be super dope so i'm um, super super pumped as the year's gone on do you get um you know super deep with it and sort of start making analogies to your life and rivalries that you might have in your conference or something and be like oh this is like infinity war where this happened or Something like that. I, I definitely have where I've said like this is like a main character fight. This is like this is something where I see like, all right, who's my who's my villain like at the time? Like who would I compare this to? Like like I remember even looking back at it, I'm like, all right, yeah, you could say if I was the Hulk, Giannis in that series was the abomination. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> like it's like we're going back at it too, just brute strength guys that are just going at it and both kind of intelligent too. Um, then you have like series replanting it's like the, the god of of like basketball or like the guy that's the most important player and stuff like that. Like you have like a um, Thanos type figure you're going okay. up against and just competing against them and, and as a team, how you bounce back. So now we're in our comeback story. This is our end game. I feel like for um, the Celtics, you know, we're, we're on our way back to, to defeat, defeat the super villain once again. Well, I feel like that's um, a great place to, to kind of leave off at. I love the end game analogy. Why don't you tell us who the different players on your team are? I heard you like gave them nicknames based off different heroes. Um, yes. So I'd love to start putting the the MCU version of the Celtics together in my head. I was about to say a lot of the guys are gone now, which is that was just sad. But um, I remember going through it. JB was Black Panther. Um, Al was uh, Cap- Captain America, just because of, he's the vet OG. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's it called? Um, who was smart was the Hulk, I believe. Um, Rob was Thor, I believe. Yes, Rob was Thor, uh, Time Lord, and everything like that. I thought about giving him Doctor Strange because of Time Lord, but uh, his in terms of like what he does and dropping like pause, dropping the hammer, and it's like dunking all the time. That was it. Um, who else is on the team right now? Oh, D White was Iron Man, just because if he's sturdy, you can always rely rely on him and stuff like that. Um, and he's very intelligent. I'm trying to guess um, who JT is now. JT, JT was, so that was the hardest one to come up with because trying to f- think out the magnitude of what he is and who he is. But like I said, vision at first, I feel like you can change that because that's the one I want to amend a little bit and find somebody for him because vision was great because like he, without vision, like 
you wouldn't have most of the movies in Marvel. You know what I mean? You wouldn't yeah. have Age of Ultron. You wouldn't have um, what's it called, Infinity War, and everything like that. And you, now it's even converted to WandaVision and stuff like that. As time is going on, so I think it's very vital to the MCU. But like, I remember comparing E to Nick Fury, and like every it was all I had. A, I had a whole shirt done about it. But um. And oh, Luke Cornett was Groot. That's a great one because of his size and also his personality. He's very funny. You got this really um, thought out. Yes, I had I had a full I had a shirt shirt done. I had full full. I thought it was like a casual thing. You got like a whole family tree. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have it all mapped out. Like I try to try my best. I'm gonna keep them in again as time goes on, though, because we have a whole new team now. Who will I make Danilo? Who will I make Malcolm? You do a really good job, I think, in general, of taking these seemingly desperate things disparate things that are passions of yours that are a big part of your story and your life and you know they're relevant they're really relevant to the work that you're doing now and uh you know your personality really shines through even on a court even nba where i think people wonder you know how do some of these things tie into the player that you are thanks brother yeah i'm gonna say i've tried my best too so um getting out of here what can you say to us about next season obviously it's your comeback story it's your end game you want to get that ring it's you got so close it seems like you know no other thing to strive for but what can you say from the inside is something that is people might not be expecting or is a little bit deeper than like yeah we're just coming back like like, what are the conversations? Like, you you have that, and is there, like, a group chat? Is there, like, are people linking up right now and strategizing? Is it about relaxing and being able right. to come back together? Like, how does a team who almost won the finals, uh, you know, almost won an NBA championship, how is that summer after for them? Yeah, so for us, it's just a matter of right now is rest. We were gone for a long time, so you have to be prepared to understand that it's going to be a long season, hopefully again next year. So take care of your bodies and take this time off. But also understanding, like, don't take too much time off and improve. Be better when you get back because um, we're all going to have to improve to do this again. There's going to be a lot of opposition. There's going to be a lot. We're now going from the hunters to the hunted. So being that has been unique a unique experience that we haven't had to go through yet. So that's what we have to do. We have to be a little more mature in our approach. And even in then, like, everybody's antsy to get back. Everybody's antsy to play. So come back with a great intent and come back with the same amount of sacrifices, if not more, in order to get the job done this time. And I'm just excited to get back, roll it, and get back to the season. But we we do know it's, like, months away. But at the same time, it feels like tomorrow. Nice. Well, wishing you the best of luck. I have some uh, some pretty close friends from Boston. I grew up in Chicago. I'm a Chicago dude. Cool, you know, I, I was blessed enough. I told you 88. So like straight up when I first came into consciousness, I didn't even realize that like your teams lose the first right. years that I really remember clearly of my life are like 95, 96. I would say Jordan years. Yeah. 72 and 10 was the first full basketball season that I remember. And then they won and then they won again. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm saying that to say, uh, my loyalty is always with the Bulls, but I have to say, you know, I cheer for you guys. Uh, I've cheered for the Patriots just because, like, the group chat is popping. Two of my best friends are from there. So, um, that's dope. Thank you. Appreciate it. We'll ho- hey, listen, Bulls, great memories, but hopefully we can convert you one day. I know you're living down. <laughs> Live living in Chicago, but hopefully we can get you back in Boston. I at least got to get out to the Garden, bro. I've never been to a game, so that's has, you know. has to happen. You know, at the minimum, let me get the full Boston experience, and uh, I'll be looking out for you. Let's see, uh, let's see where you can take it. Like I said, stats, the minutes, everything is up this year. Um, but I think you have a lot to prove. You know, just keeping it real. I think I see, I see a lot of. It's like a blend of optimism and skepticism, <laughs> and like, right. and and how do you take that? I mean, I assume the easy answer is like, hey, I just take it and I work hard. But it's like. You know, does it eat at you? Do you feel like, damn, you know, there's a play you can't get out of your head and you want to prove to everybody that, you know, you can do better next time? There's always more to be done, I always say. You know, if you get complacent with where you're at, you're not doing the right thing. So they should be optimistic, but they also should be pessimistic because at the end of the day, you have to prove yourself and you have to prove it to everyone else as well. So take it as a challenge and continue to compete not only with them, but with yourself. All right, Grant. Well, 
We'll look out to see what you do next season. Thank you for coming on to the My Other Passion podcast. You are certainly a perfect example of the type of guests that we have. I never knew that someone could uh, connect the Marvel Universe to the NBA so well, but you did it. And I really appreciate your time here today. Thanks for having me, man. All right, brother. Take it easy. Take it easy. So that's a wrap on another episode of the My Other Passion podcast. Love Grant Williams. Such an awesome conversation. I'm really excited to see where that guy takes it in the league. I might even have to get out to Boston, check out a game myself, like we were saying. And just in general, everybody who's been listening, watching, and all honestly, the feedback and the way this thing is going has been a lot better than I expected. You know, I had good expectations, but truly the feedback has been awesome. The reviews have been great. And just to see this thing so quickly rising up the charts, you know, on the Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, that's what we want. We want to have good conversations. We want to find out what these passions are really about, how they inform the great things that our guests do. And I think so far, you know, it's been a pretty fun journey figuring that out, but we have lots more to do. Many more huge guests on the way, a lot more insightful conversations. We'll be back on Wednesday. You can always hit me up at Ernest Baker on Twitter, Ernest at FOS Company, FOS.company. I want to shout out my producer, Daniel Myrick, young kid, really grinding, doing a great job so far. Of course, front office sports, you know, best sports newsletter in the world. You know, the most important thing to me is that you learn something, you get something out of these episodes. You know, we can all realize just how multifaceted we are ourselves. A lot of people that we watch on TV or look up to in the sports space, in the business space. And I'll leave it there. My other passion. We'll see you next week.